Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining this MBL lecture today. Uh, let me begin by introducing our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Thomas. Um, he's there, uh, based in Canada now, joining on Zoom today. Uh, Jeffrey is, is a multi-skilled professional. He combined his doctoral, uh, he completed his doctoral uh, research on religious speciality with OCMS in 2021. He combines eight years in local church leadership with 14 years in the home construction and improvement industry with research on development, interfaith relations, and Christian mission to explore how genuine Christian space or praxis emerges within ostensibly secular places. The lecture title today is, as you see in the, on the screen, it is Luke and his faith. Michel de Satu and a question of means and ends, assessing outcomes for Christian mission. So with this, we hand it over to Jeffrey. And you can spend about 50 minutes and one hour, and then we can have a Q&A session later. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speaking to OCMS again and to be sharing um, a little bit about what's been on my mind as of late. Um, and and with, with that in mind, I want to just give a bit of a, a, a background and introduction to, to the topic before I move on. So I want you to take a look at, if I can figure out how this works. Oh, there it is. So um, a couple of different pictures. So change, change in house, homes, and lifestyles. So what you see here on the left is, is a picture of what a residential suburban area of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada presently looks like. And on the right, you will see what the same area of the city or a similar area of the city looked like in the 1950s. I don't need to go into too much detail, but you can definitely see the difference in the size of homes and the size of the lot that the home is built on and and then um, the roadways and how much space there is between houses and the traffic. Um, what I would draw your attention to something specifically is you'll notice in the houses on the right, they have no garages. Um, so any vehicle parking would be done on the road or outside the house where on the left, um, they have significantly large garages that are all in the front of the house. So that is what you see at the road front, um, street front is the garage. Now, the reason that I bring this up is simply to highlight the idea of a questioning on design and outcomes. Um, and, and the context for this is, is just simply the idea of the changing sense of community that takes place in some of these urban areas and the question about local community, a sense of local community and the way that people interact with one another. In the 1950s, just some, some specifics, you can see there that the houses, the lot size was about 50 square meters. The houses would be single story, 65 to 100 meters squared, three bedroom, one bathroom houses with an average of four people per household. There was no garage or a single garage off the back of the garden and the house would be centered in the lot which meant that there was a great deal of front garden space and a rear garden space where community life could take place. Whereas um, over the last 70 years, as the process of urban construction has taken place and population increase has taken place, what you see now is a significantly smaller lot size, 374 meters squared, but a much larger house, 241 meters squared, generally with three and a half bedrooms, three bathrooms, and on average 2.8 people per household rather than four. So smaller lots, larger house, fewer people um, with a two vehicle garage in the driveway. Um, but again, with the house centered in the lot, but what you can just recognize is that the whole of the property is essentially taken up by individual home living spaces. Um, something you may not have recognized here is if you look at this picture here, you can see the fencing 
Um, those fences off the back of the houses are all two meter tall privacy fences. So once they've been installed, as you're standing in your back garden, you can't see any of your neighbors. Whereas if you go back to the previous picture, there is no fencing. So um, house lots, house gardens would run into each other. And so there was very much the opportunity when you were outside your house that you would be able to interact and engage in these spaces of encounter with one another. And the question that I just have, have regarding this is, are the processes or the, the, the elements of design that have gone into urban construction somehow contributing to outcomes in community life? So can we assume a link between the differences in city planning and the differences in lifestyle and community over time? Or are the changes in city planning a cause or an outcome in differences in lifestyle and community? Again, what sorts of data-driven research-based decisions have gone into the city planning? From there, how might we assess what kind of differences in lifestyle and community, if any, is created by the changes in city planning? And in the midst of this, how do we define the means of impact on community and lifestyle? How do we define the outcomes of city planning? And the reason that I wanted to just bring that up is because it provides a fairly easy analogy, at least, to the concept of Liu and Espace, um, which roughly, well, particularly translated Liu means place, Espace means space. And I'll get into a little bit more of an explanation as to what I mean by that further on. But I think it creates a reasonable parallel for me to move on to the next question that I have. And that has to do with missiological research or mission outcomes. Are we making an impact or missing the mark? Now the background particularly for that subject has to do with conversations on measuring mission impact and measuring mission research impact that came out of some conversations that I had while I did some work with Openwell Oxford and their church planting work of Europe collaboration. But it's also been a constant question that's come up since I've relocated back to Canada. I've taken on my job with White Court Baptist Church here in Alberta, Canada. And some of the, the categories for this I've taken from Haywon Kim's article in Missiology, an international review called Missiological Research, Making Impact or Missing the Mark, where she <laughs> argues that in order for missiological research to have an effective impact in mission praxis, there need to be four areas of academic activities that are combined with mechanisms for knowledge exchange. And these are that you need to educate people, you need to increase the stock of codified knowledge, that means you need to order the mission's knowledge that's had. Having done that, you need to provide a public space where that knowledge can take root, and then you need to involve, get engaged in some sort of problem solving. So those are the academic activities. The mechanisms that she suggests are the importance of training skilled leaders, disseminating knowledge, directing engagement, or having direct engagement or a co-production between scholars and stakeholders, and then collaborative problem solving between mission researchers and mission practitioners on the specific issues of mission. However, and this is where it gets to my content on Michel de Certeau, is that <clears throat> I wanted to raise the question as to in the process of codification, training, and collaborative participation, are we in some sense creating a sense of loss that is taking place on the mission field? Does the process of codification, training, and collaborate participation create an actual loss in the spaces of encounter that take place in mission fields? As, as a background for that and the context for my discussion, I wanted to step into um, an article that was produced or a chapter that was produced in the 2013 Regnum title, Mission Spirituality and Authentic Discipleship, where the General Secretary of the Organization of African Instituted Churches, Nick de Lubel, contributed a piece entitled Doing Mission at the Margins of Society. 
harnessing the resources of local vision. Now he begins his paper by discussing a contrast that took place at the 1910 Edinburgh Conference, where first Christians were meeting at that time to strategize on how to evangelize the unreached world. At that time, but at that time, there was also the Holy Spirit was beginning to speak in a new way, beginning to speak from the margins. He identifies two different locations, the Edinburgh Conference, where there is a sense of collective construction directed towards mission on the margins. But it was located within a dominant sociological and theological framework that was distanced from the local work of God. Yeah. And yeah. that's contrasted with... Yeah these emerging African independent churches that were that though on the sidelines of the dominant movements and activities of society were doing mission in a way that challenged the established understanding of mission. So consequently, he locates the mission of the AICs in a founding vision or a divine guidance in a local context, and then asks the question, that can this founding vision in this local context that motivates the essential mission on the margin of society become a resource or even shape the larger dominant social and theological framework of mission, such as that that was taking place in Edinburgh in 1910. So the basic dynamic he addresses is how to situate the particular and dynamic dimensions of the AICs in relation, in relation to these dominant mission theologies principally shaped by what at the time was the large comprehensive narrative on mission and mission research. The background of the comparison, now I just wanna make a note, I am not an expert on African independent churches or on the organization of African instituted churches. Um, I simply want to use the chapter um, that NICTA published in that regnum, um, in that regnum work just as, as a subject through which to talk about uh, Deserto and Liu and Espas and his theological framework. So I'm going to just give you a bit of a background on Lubao's work on the AICs. I'm going to introduce a little bit about Michel Deserto and his project, um, his theological theoretical framework, Liu and Espas, strategy and tactics, and how I can see that there may be some overlay within the missions project. And my intent here is to raise some questions and to just generally get a sense of the implications for the means and ends of mission research and practice. So the background. The central characteristics Lubell notes of AICs emerge out of each church's independent sense of founding vision, a divinely ordered mission, what God has told them to do around them limited to the society in which they belong and how they understand their behavior in this world to be shaped by that belief. Often, the impetus for this founding vision, it was some experienced or understood, understood sense of emerging crisis. At the time, what, what Nikta identifies is that as colonial powers were leaving certain African contexts, there was some sense of loss in the structure of meaning. And as there were various sociological or cultural um, challenges, um, that cultural domination, political domination, and spiritual domination gave way to an opportunity for a space of encounter, this emerging um, founding vision, this emerging work of God. Because at the time, the dangers of the present could not be dispelled by any expectation of future security. And in the midst of that, Lubal describes how that encounter with God overcame fear and spoke power to the local context in a powerful way. And as a result, the AICs in this founding vision took on a priestly and a prophetic role in the community, not only providing a method for worship, but a direction for the community in sense of their current local context. Another identifying characteristic of the AICs is their ability to build a cohesive community within the broader social context. But in the midst of these three things, as the AICs emerged, these communities also took on um, 
a, a strongly critical rejection of a secular modern and, and the, the modern value of individual expressivism. So you have these very localized communities um, addressing very particular problems within their specific contexts. And in the midst of that, training within the churches took place. It was individual training and nurturing, a collective encouragement, um, rebuke and peer advice through particular ministry opportunities and, and done through tactics which were very relational, very encountered, very particular, and very situated within that particular context. But the AICs as a, as, as a, a larger group um, expre experienced a great deal of critique and tension related to the um, larger, as, as Nick De refers to them as, respectable theological circles. One particular challenge arose from the unwillingness or the inability of those in the AICs to engage civic issues according to generally practiced methods. He gives particular reference to, um, uh, to gender issues and the manner in which gender issues began to be dealt with in the early 20th century and how the AICs retained a very strongly patriarchal leadership structure. But then more recently, how emerging civic issues of health crises regarding HIV and AIDS and how the AICs have responded differently than um, what is generally uh, has been understood as conventional or practiced methods. Further, the AICs rejected dominant sources of education, um, preferring to emphasize their, their uh, oral practices of learning and oral practices of communicating information. And as a result, creating a further tension between themselves and the wider dominant framework. And yet in the midst of this, um, as the AICs were developing their own theology, there was engagement with an outside theology and which led to an emergence of what Nikta refers to as a two level theology where um, leaders having to, um, who'd been trained in dominant theologies trying to engage in local context developed this two-level theology where what is most deeply believed by many people could not be properly articulated within the dominant framework. And what was respectable in the theological circles was not deeply felt in the local context, which put a significant constraint on content on, on AIC mission and has, as AICs have looked to more deeply involve themselves in the wider Christian context. So, Lubal and uh, Nikta concludes that despite the limitations, though, and some of the criticism, he really thinks that there's an opportunity for the, the founding vision and the spirit work that's taking place in the IC's holistic mission to contribute to the wider church. Now, the process that he said, he suggests a process that is remarkably similar to that identified by Hay Wan in her article. And so it's, it's very similar to some form of uh, training skilled leaders, disseminating knowledge, directing engagement um, between mission researchers and stakeholders, and collaborative problem solving. So he says the first thing that they did is that they documented founding visions um, in order to track the changes and better to, to, to better make it uh, available for the founding vision to be applied over time in different areas. This ordering allowed for a recognition that some of the symbols and practices um, of the original founding visions may not have been relevant in contemporary situations. The next step that they did is they engaged um, umbrella organizations or outside organizations to provide objective overviews of political or civic situations, and then invited AIC leaders to discuss and reflect on the spiritual meaning of the situation through prayer the reading of scripture and ending with a challenge for action and thereby trying to re-engage AICs with some of the dominant civic contexts and, and methods used to address particular situations. This included other participatory learning and action tools, providing um, sociological access and control tools being used by AICs to illuminate social realities of health, gender disparity and environmental issues um, the process of which though showing that the problems that AICs may be facing internally are, are not very different to the problems that are being faced in the dominant context and that there could be 
some sharing of resources and sharing of information. So he concludes by writing that because God is concerned about the people at the margins of society, through the Holy Spirit and the scriptures, God can empower them in unique ways. And this empowerment leads to an action which may sometimes be disruptive to accepted models of mission. But unlike Christ's disciples who said, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he is not one of us. He says, we should start looking at, at those in mission, especially those at, at the margins of mission and say, we have found a people who are doing things in a different way and we would like to enable them to sharpen their mission so that not only can they be more effective, but that they can contribute to the wider mission of the church. Now, as I mentioned, it's not my intention to comment or critique um, the AICs and the work of OAIC, rather to provide the background that will function as that, a background with which to portray spatial terms. So to summarize, what, what, in, uh, what um, Nikta originally identifies is a, a dominant mission research framework in Edinburgh in 1910 and the emergence of these spaces of encounter, these particular um, movements of the spirit within a local context. And, and that over a period of time, the, there was uh, a disruptive uh, relationship between the two and that what emerged was a desire to um, bring the benefits of both in to help one another. And so taking some of the methods and the ideas on codification and training and problem solving from the dominant framework and introduce it into the, the local context of the AICs to help equip them to do their work better on the margins. And at the same time, then take some of this energy and this founding vision spirituality from the local context and, and allow that to feed into some of the uniqueness that comes out of that and feed that into the dominant order. So that's the dynamic that's taken place over the last little bit more than a century. It's towards that dynamic though in that process that Sirteau has, I think, something particular to say. Um, Sirteau, if you're not familiar and not aware, um, he was a French Jesuit scholar. Um, he was a, a is a historian of spirituality and, and did a fair bit of work on social theory. And much of his work was focused on an effort to articulate genuine Christian spaces or praxis in a world that had increasingly left Christianity and the church with little or no place within the dominant social order. This question de Certeau insists is not though answerable in a way of theoretical constructs or instituted programs. In order to identify and articulate and create a space for genuine Christian mission, he says we need to find a way that avoids what he calls a writing that conquers, the ordering of information that objectifies what is otherwise subjective. Instead, we need to find Christian, how to make Christianity thinkable today is to find ways to make it a concrete and embodied action, a lived practice by which alone the living God is discovered, as he says, ever anew in the world day to day. So in seeking to articulate how Christians are to exist, Desertot presents a seminal notion of Christianity as an other, a heterology in virtue of the Christian community existing within a space of encounter, that has been opened up by the work of Jesus Christ, by his spirit and the world. This space of encounter is shaped not only by the social and the spiritual, but also the material and the physical. And that landscape opens up, that space of encounter opens up particular ways of proceeding, ways of living specific to local Christian communities of faith. And according to which alone Deserteau considers Christianity genuinely thinkable today. In this, his articulation of the possibilities for Christian space within and against what he considered the dominant secular hegemonizing logic and practices of modernity rest upon an analysis of his way of being, belief, and behavior and how they script or how they write individual social and communal bodies. This whole project is framed within Sirteau's methodology which is first 
to define what structures order or enclose subjects. So that's sort of like this dominant social or dominant theoretical framework that's articulated within a particular order. And yet he shows that within this particular order, there may be enclosures or fissures or instances of difference within which spaces of encounter take place, which are different than the dominant order, that they appropriate elements of the dominant order and imbue them with particular and new senses of meaning. Now, to summarize or to, to perhaps oversimplify Disserto in a sense, he considers the dominant theoretical framework and dominant orders as essentially lifeless. And I'll get on to explain and provide some imagery as to how he understands that. But he says the particular dominant order is lifeless in the sense that it takes those particular instances of relational meaning, those um, perhaps uh, elements of human life and human existence that are that are that that go beyond our ability to conceptualize and objectify and order them and strives to make sense of them in such a way as to put them in an order that in the process of doing removes them of their essential meaning and so for the christian context within a dominant secular framework he says if if the Christian context strives to fit within the dominant the theoretical framework, it loses its vitality and its viability. And the reality of Christian experience is to develop authentic and genuine spaces of encounter that are distinct from, although within, the dominant framework. So what de Soto ends to do is to create an alternative um, in that idea he says his method and project to serve to cultivate or to argue for the, the importance of interruptions and openings that allow an authentic otherness to exist within, though often hidden, among a dominant order without losing its own being and without having to move towards, um, towards the same, towards the dominant framework. How do you maintain that and that vitality? His spatial project is designed to recognize the variability and the possibility of that non-dominant social expression or production in any given dominant context and to give warning to what happens if that distinctive element is taken away. Within this then, Desertos project, he is not primarily concerned with what is visible and with what is not, with who is heard and with who is not, with who has power, and with who does not. Because he finds invisibility within the dominant framework, visibility within the framework, a voice within the framework, and power within the framework is that ordering capacity which removes the vitality from the space of encounter. He argued um, in the midst of this about the danger. He wrote during the time of the student revolts in Paris in the 1960s and 70s, and he warned against the danger of, of giving, of not, not of not listening to the critique in the context of the students and their reason for revolt, but the danger of striving for power and how the striving for power um, leads to a lack of vitality and how the possibility of his argument is that the possibility of striving for a voice within the order creates a loss in the space of encounter which can't be recovered so while he posits um the the dominant order what he calls the liu and the space of encounter his espace so place and space he attests that they are, while they are in a dialogical relationship, they're in this horizon of continual discourse, he says, there is an identification and an interrelation between the two, and that there is some connection that is always possible, but there is within that, there's constantly incur occurring the possibility of both a beneficial and a detrimental dynamic. So to articulate a little bit about that, I want to get into his particular spatial terms. Um, 
uh, Liu and Espace or, and strategy and tactics. So articulate, to articulate the dynamic di described above, Deserteau uses these terms, Liu and Espace, strategy and tactics, leading to ideas of practice and culture. And beyond the specific application to Christian praxis amid an enclosed modern social order, he uses the framework to see places or hear voices whose true life is not made by demarcating its own dominant or proper order, but rather by way of creating spaces of meaning or finding perhaps this founding vision amidst, um, hold on a second, but rather by creating spaces of meaning opened up in the world by encounters with the other. Now I should have moved my slides here a little bit forward. So that um, we'll, get, we'll get there. The significance of these appositional terms emerges not only from what they signify, but the relationship between them, that possibility of both a beneficial and detrimental dynamic. A key passage from his work, The Practice of Everyday Life, reads, he says, I call a strategy the calculation or the manipulation of power relations that become possible when a subject of will and power, a business, an army, a city, a research institution can be set apart. It postulates a place, a liu, to be delimited as its own proper, to serve as the base from which to manage relations with everything outside it, which it composes as targets for understanding or threats to its existence, be these customers or competitors, enemies, the country surrounding the city, or the objects or objects objects or objectives of research. Strategy for De Sirteau is a function of and emerges from and reinforces Liu. Strategy is the practice that orders the place. Liu then is the organization of a clean, is the way that he puts it. It is the organization of a place where the ambiguities of the world have to be exercised to make possible and available a partial but regulatable operation. This clean, this order is complete. The state is achieved through maintaining it and ordering it to assess, direct, and anticipate issues and alterities, bringing, bringing some of them into the order through creative management of strategies. Though he says this is only ever a postulate, as Liu, uh, uh, of Liu, Liu, as will be shown, it is never wholly ordered. To this, Liu and strategy, so the place and the practices that create the ordered space, such as um, a mission, mission practice or mission research, he contrasts with espace and tactics. In contrast with strategies, whose successive figures introduce a certain movement into a formal scheme, he positions a tactic. So the tactics are the practices of espace. They're the ways that spaces of encounter are created. They have no proper center, no locus of power, no delimitation of what is exterior to them. The place of the tactic is the place of the holy other. And these tactics, these everyday activities produce the espace or the founding vision to use the language from the AICs. The relationship of tactics to espace is different than that of strategies to you, however. The pressing point of contrast Deserteau and identifies is that tactics are practiced without a proper order or a proper locus. So what is meant is that the tactical practices exist within and use the resources of the dominant order without having an order of their own. Unlike strategies, tactics are undertaken by those um, on the outside or those other to the dominant order. And the espace is created through the inventive use of elements within the order, turning to them towards a different intention. Um, before I move on, I just want to give uh, just a final delimitation and contrast needing prior to moving on to refer to the AICs, get back to the AICs and the OAIC 
Edinburgh 1910 and the wider mission and institutional research. And this is again to quote Disserteau, at the outset, he says, between Leo and Espace, I make a distinction which will delimit a field. Place, Liu, is the order of whatever kind in accord with which elements are distributed in relationships of coexistence. There is no possibility therein of two things being in the same location. The law of order rules in Liu. Any elements taken into consideration are, are put in relation to one another, beside one another, located in its own particular place, distinct and defined. Liu is thus an instantaneous configuration of order and positions, defining the dynamics and the relations of all that exist within it. It implies an indication of stability. An espace exists, however, when one takes into consideration the vectors of direction, velocities, the changing of time. Espace is composed of intersections, relationships, mobile elements, it is in a sense activated by the ensemble of movements deployed within it. Espace occurs as an effect produced by the movements and the relations and the practices that orient it towards its story, that situate it, temporalize it, and lead it to function in a unity of conflicting programs. Espace compared to Liu is as the word when it is spoken. That is when it is caught in the ambiguity of reality and transformed into a term that depends upon different conventions and situated as the act of a present and modified by the transformations that come from successive context. Unlike Liu, it has no univocity or stability. It is, in, in a word, a messy dynamic. In short, Deserteau formalizes a distinction with the well-known phrase that l'espace d'un lieu pratique, or space is practiced place. To give a bit of an illustration that would help situate some of that, um, a little bit of the complex uh, theoretical framework, two practical images can help to illustrate these elements of Deserteau's spatial theorization. Um, Deserteau's most famous illustration is that of looking down on the city of Manhattan from the World Trade Center. He writes, beneath the haze stirred up by winds, he suggests that the spectator can read in it a universe that is exploding and is at the same time immobilized before the eyes as the whole totalizing narrative of the immoderate city is written. The image that he gives is standing in the tower and looking down on the city. And standing in the tower and looking down on the city, while in the distance some movement of traffic and pedestrians is visible, what stands out and what dominates the frame is the sense of order that the city planners have imposed upon the city. You can see the infrastructure. You can see the design and the proximity of buildings. You can see the roadways. You can see any fences. You can see the power lines. You can see the traffic lights. And what standing above the city provides is this scope, an immobilized scope of the life of the city. It's a static order. It's a description of what is um, ordered, what is static, um, what is present, and the sense of planning, and the meaning behind the planning is readily apparent. He says, to be lifted to the summit is to be lifted out of the city's life, out of the city's grasp. In it, you leave behind the mass that carries off and mixes up itself in any identity of authors and spectators. It puts the viewer puts the researcher, puts the planner at a distance and gives a sense of an all-seeing power. This is the station of the city planner or manager whose vision of the city is then technologized, utilized, and empowered to craft order, craft the directives and the means by which the place is set and therefore gets its meaning. 
That is the Liu of the city. And he contrasts that with the pedestrian's experience of the vision of the city. Because pedestrians on the ground and vehicles on the ground don't experience the city from the totalizing view of the sky. They experience the city as fragmentary, as shaped by their identity on the streets, the story of where I'm coming from, where I'm going to. Who is it that is about me? What are the means and the ways that I must move through this particular landscape in order to write the meaning of my life upon the sidewalks? He says, the pedestrian experiences a vision of the city. But being able to, by being able to appropriate the city's productions as locations in which to write their story with their feet, creating the espace, creating the places, the spaces of encounter in which their lives actually have meaning. Perhaps more related to the issue at hand, though, is Dissertot's image of the relation between the colonizing Spanish and the native populations of South America. There, he says, arose an ambiguity that subverted from within the Spanish colonizers success in imposing their liu, the liu of their culture on the indigenous population. He records that the colonizers went in and they set about particular neighbor or forts, populated areas within which they ordered the lives of not only the colonizers that were there, but the indigenous of the area when they came. They brought in laws, they brought in rules, they brought in plans and management that structured and ordered everything from the daily worship of all the people to the production of goods, to the organization of family. And yet within that, Desertot records that while submissive or even subjecting, the locals nevertheless often made of the rituals, the representations, and the laws imposed on them something quite different from what the conquerors had in mind. And he cites anthropological research, which indicates that despite the efforts of the Spanish colonizers to quote unquote, civilize the indigenous, what was found is that generation after generation, while adopting, appropriating the orders, uh, appropriating the representations of the colonizers, the indigenous communities were able to maintain their own sense of value, their own narratives, their own values, their own ways of life, and even their own worship. So while subverting and in time ultimately shaping practice, but not by rejecting or altering them, but by using the colonizers with respect to ends and references foreign to their system, foreign to the system that the indigenous had no choice but to accept. Inscribed in the event is a feel, but, but for the indigenous though, we can recognize that there's inscribed in that a feeling of loss. These indigenous were an other within a very liu, an order that outwardly assimilated but their use of the dominant social order deflected its power, even though incurring a loss. Because this order was something they lacked the means to challenge. Now, De Certeau's apositional terms explained in theory and, and given some image in that example can now be considered or overlaid against Edinburgh 1910 and the AICs as a means of questioning mission ends, mission means and ends. Nick the contrasts between the totalizing mission organization of Edinburgh 1910 and the emergence of Holy Spirit empowered spiritual experience as new movements. And he, it could be overlaid as a contrast between Liu and Espace. In terms already described, the Edinburgh 1910 um, conference can be seen as a subject with will and power delimiting its own, its own order, delimiting a Liu the intent and scope of world missions to serve as the basis from which to manage relations within an exteriority composed of its objectives of mission activity. There, the conference then could be seen as a totalizing narrative of the meaning of Christian mission, which could be evidenced by the eight commissions that followed from the conference. 
And in contrast to that, though, could be the tactics evidenced by the AICs appropriating existing colonial church products, systems, language, locations, and turning them towards different ends. Nick denotes that the founding visions as responses to perceived loss, motivating people through a sense of encounter to create a space, a desired state different from that imposed in which the space of the tactic is the space of encounter and marginal Christian practice took on meaning in the midst of a dominant theological form. However, as I mentioned in the introduction in the background, Nikta describes a process by which, a process by which the codification training and collaborative participation of the AICs in recent decades has been an effort to increase their capacity while at the same time contributing to wider mission. The key dynamic of the process of ordering, according to Deserteau, undermines and empties the spaces of encounter with their vitality. If we accept Deserteau's theorizations as a way of locating places and spaces of meaning, and his qualifications of the practice required for their creation, it raises certain questions about the process that NICTA and the AICs have undergone. Taking Deserto seriously means that some mission outcomes or productions may be measured in the conventional sense of identifying artifacts of Christian order, artifacts of Christian mission, in terms of objects produced by people that contribute to the shaping of Christian mission. That is, texts, lectures, conferences, organizations, buildings. And these open practices contribute to, contribute to the management of Christian mission practice and research as an order, as a liu. But returning to Nikta's description of the work of OIC, he describes in that as this program of facilitating the AIC's effectiveness and mission that is documenting the founding visions, tracking changes in the visions, creating resources to manage diverse voices and changing contexts and introducing objective analysis into the local thought to manage the diverse voices, to bring a sense of order within changing context and introducing objective analysis into the local thought. Despite the benefits that he argues for, he also articulates that this ordering created a sense of loss, most dominantly in his language about the two level theology. That in the process of ordering something went missing in the process of the ordering, the founding vision was in some sense emptied of its space of encounter, emptied of that particular vision. The AICs then, in an effort to increase their capacity and contribute to the wider frame, have lost a sense of, according to Nikta, their local context, their local significance of meaning as they have striven to participate in the wider order. When an ordering strategy is applied, there is some sense of loss that takes place in the incorporating subject. Lubal noted that early on the AICs people developed their understanding of mission through listening to the voice of the spirit and reading the scriptures and the situations in which they are placed. But later he suggests that as the AICs encountered the dominant theologies and theological training and research, or in the efforts of the AICs to contribute to the thought and practice of the wider church, the two level theology development, and there was a loss in the ability of the people to hear the voice of the spirit in the particular and local context. In the narrative provided by Lubel, what is illustrated may be seen not so much then as a vision emerging from the margins to offer resources for contemporary mission, but instead a dominant theological mission writing that conquers. The effort to measure and order through mission research and through mission productivity has potentially limited the meaning and creative capacity of the founding vision and the local people. So I ask the question to end, can the process of codification, training, and collaborative participation be accomplished in a way that does not lead to an accompanying sense of loss? 
If so, how? How do we adjust the way we see out, we assess outcomes? How do we allow for perhaps unseen practices and unheard voices resisting the urge to catalog, to order, to platform and include? to welcome and leave disordered spaces and times and the messiness of relationships, accepting inefficiency for the sake of creativity. And, and to illustrate something of the point and to give a bit of a context for, for further discussion, I just wanna illustrate something from my experience at OCMS. <laughs> early, in, early in my OCMS journey at the RIS, which was called RIS when I started, I don't even know what it's called um, now, the induction that takes place at the beginning for students. Um, a phrase that was said to me is that the, the PhD is the student, it's not the dissertation, right? So it was framed in some sense that the research journey was about the forming of a person, not of a particular outcome. That stuck with me. Prior, shortly prior to my leaving um, Oxford to come work here, I was asked about the possibility of joining Tom Harvey in doing an assessment of, um, of the mission outcomes of OCMS and to start asking questions about how do we evaluate the benefit of OCMS. And so while I'm, my participation with that hasn't continued, um, I spent a good deal of time reading about how you evaluate research programs to, to, to determine um, their impact. How do you do an impact assessment on research outcomes? And in reading it, I was reading, like I said in, in the text there, it, the, the outcomes are measured in text produced, number of students in, posi in teaching positions, number of students moving on to positions of authority, um, programs that have emerged out of research. But the mission outcomes or the Im impact assessment never did anything to assess the people and the personal development of the people, which struck me as, as, as interesting considering the way that the PhD journey was positioned for me at the very beginning. When I look back, like um, Wai-Chain asked me prior to moving on whether I've had a chance to publish my dissertation, and I have not. I haven't gone on to do any of that right now. And so my dissertation sits on a shelf. Um, but when I look back at my own particular research and my own particular research um, journey and the outcomes of it, and I've tried to identify um, what means produce the greatest outcome for my time at OCMS, for me personally anyway, in reflection, it hasn't been the ordered events. It wasn't the lectures. It wasn't the seminars I participated in. It wasn't my structured relationship with my mentor or my supervisor. Um, it wasn't even my research question and the journey that I went through on answering that. Um, because even the outcome of my research, like the, the best insights that I ever had on my research came from what I could call hidden practices from tactical practices in the midst of my time at OCMS. And that was relationships with students, mm. sitting in the pub, having conversations, um, taking walks through the Port Meadow and talking about life and about research. And, and what it highlights for me is that OCMS as a, as a mission research center, or even my church um, as a disciple making center, um, we order our business and we order our programs and we strive to order our outcomes. And we measure our impact and we measure our outcomes by what we produce. When often, to take the language of Certo, our ability to measure what we produce is, is located in a sense of order and strategies and dominant, dominant models of thinking Whereas the real life that takes place in a research center, in a church, as a mission practitioner, are in the spaces of encounter that take place in local contexts between relations. And so the question that I have in terms of means and ends for Christian mission is how do we structure and how do we organize into our mission research and into our mission practice messy spaces for encounter to take place? 
Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jeffrey, for your excellent, inspiring, and challenging lecture. Uh, if you stop the same, uh, screen, that could be helpful. Stop sharing the screen. Yeah, I'll try and get that figured out. Yes. And if you have any questions, you know, then you can raise your hands either by clicking the reaction button if you're on Zoom, or you can raise your hands here. So, uh, John, but let me ask my, my question for you first. So thank you again, Jeffrey, for your wonderful lecture. And um, um, as you say, uh, according to the Sato, uh, there are two different types of practices in our daily lives. One is strategies, another one is tactics. And a strategy is, is a way of arranging space uh, by powerful people in our society <laughs> uh, for control and discipline through proposing and establishing uh, norms and kind of rules. So I think a strategy is, is public, it is official, and it is visible. And on the other hand, uh, tactics are like individual people's response to that you know, strategy uh, by being obedient or being re resistant you know, by being modifying those kind of strategy that I do not like uh, to make them appropriate in my life. So I think there is a kind of tension between strategy and tactic always in our society. And as far as I know, uh, this sort of, he emphasized about the balance, having the balance between strategy and, and tactic in a, in a society. And the same tension can be observed everywhere where mission is taking place. As you say, a dominant missiological, theological framework comes into a local place by missionaries who are powerful because of their money and power of education. You know, they come into and they try to impose their theological, missiological framework and understanding of mission to local people. And that is one powerful people. And on the other hand, there are some kind of tactical response <laughs> from the local people, you know, they want to do their own mission their own, in their own way, uh, reflecting what is going on in their own context. So there is a tension here. So as uh, this tour, he emphasized about balance, having strategy and tactic. What is the meaning of having balance in this kind of mission, uh, uh, you know, uh, mission field? The tension between the tension tension between the powerful dominant physiological framework coming from abroad and tactical response from the local people. So there's one question, how does it look like if we have got a balance between this dominant theology and missiology and, and emergence of local theology and missiology? And second one, your sub-question, subtitle is assessing outcomes for Christian missions. So who is qualified to assess the outcome? Who are going to assess it? Is it dominant powerful people from outside imposing their theological, missiological framework to the local people? Or is it those local people who are proposing a kind of new theology and new missiology from their context? Or do we have to employ somebody from outside, completely neutral person, third party to come and assess? So what is your answer? <laughs> well, I, I think I think first off to respond to that, I think um, correct, correctly you've identified that that Sirto speaks of, of a tension between Liu and Espas and recognizes a particular tension between strategies and tactics. And yes, he recognizes that that, the, that there is there is some dynamic interrelation and that the two are taking place all the time. Um, I, I'm not sure, however, that he that he indicates a sense of balance. Um, I think I think what he says it's more presumes is that uh, this totalizing effort of Li, of Liu of Spast and the strategies to create a sense of order and and to organize is just a natural outcome of, of of having a will and a power and a and a desire to enforce um a particular a particular narrative or to establish a particular narrative 
And so it emerges, Eliu emerges whenever, and the word that he uses is, um, is this locus, is, is a particular objective um, with the power to bring that objective about takes place. And so <clears throat> it's, I think it's important to recognize first within that then that the Liu can be um, of several scales. Like, like in a very particular way, it could be a, um, an international scale, it could be a geopolitical scale. It could also be in the local context, a local scale um, within a local municipality or even the context of a local church or even a family that, that the individual or the relations with a will and a power to establish order have the capacity to bring about an order. Um, I mean, I could just utilize the example of my family and my kids. My, my wife and I have a, have a desire to establish a particular order within our home. And we have in some sense, a will and a power to make that, make that take place. Um, however, as any of you have had children can recognize is that children have a remarkable ability to creatively apply the order that you have established within a home towards ends that you would never have imagined. Okay. Right? And so the scale, the scale of Liu can be can be anything from small to large. And I think what um what the rea the relationship then that that has with Espas is 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 coincidingly then wherever, and I think Desertot would argue is that wherever there is a Liu, wherever there is that sense of order, there is Espas. There are those who don't have power. There are those who are the other that are on the outside in some relation to whom the order is being imposed. And, and it is those to whom the order is being imposed will, within their own narrative story, without the creation of their own story, will appropriate the order towards an ends that, um, that the order didn't intend. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose it's not so much a question of balance as it is just a recognition that these dynamics are always going on. Mm -hmm. And so within the, within the mission context, then it's not to suggest that the idea of mission research or mission practice shouldn't be ordered and shouldn't be thoughtful and organized and shouldn't be intended to create certain ends. I think that's a vitally important concept built into the very notion of mission is that the idea of mission is that we have something particular from within a Christian theological framework, within the idea of Christian encounter with God, we have something that we are to bring and we are that should in some sense order the, the way of human engagement in the with each other and with the world. It's just more a recognition that within that order, within that effort, there is going to be this espace, there's going to be the tactical um, applications within that that are always some in some form of dynamic intention and some sort of interrelation that 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 is either pushing back on the order or isn't pushing back on the order you know and something that sir Tono, uh, particularly mentions is that and it's actually a dynamic that he draws when he's talking about cultures that people have tended to tended to think about his terms um in the language of culture and counterculture mm -hmm. that we have the dominant culture and then we have the counterculture which is reacting to or rebelling against or striving to create a different narrative but he says what's actually happening within that context is a culture and then the culture he says because the dominant culture accepts the counterculture as it as part of the overall story and so the counterculture happens in the open it's recognized and therefore it's part of the liu the espas are these hidden practices, these things that don't get noticed, these things that can't be measured without, um, without in some sense destroying them, without in some sense creating this idea of loss. So the espas is something that is particularly slippery, and it's not necessarily something that can be measured through mission outcome um, or through can, cannot necessarily be measured. And so if I were to apply it in a sense of mission research and outcomes to get to the question of who is qualified to assess mission outcomes? I think what I would say is 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 very little different than what we're already doing. Um, you've got people who are who are experts. 
either through um, being particular practitioners within a given field or they're subject experts. They've given a significant amount of time and effort to understanding the particularities of a location that within the order, it is, it is these people who are equipped to assess the outcomes of the mission endeavor. The outcomes, however, of the spatial and the espace endeavor, what I think Deserteau would say is don't measure them. <laughs> just, just leave them alone. Because, because that space of encounter, once you strive to articulate the space of encounter, once you strive to codify that space of encounter, that tactical operation, you remove it from that vitality and it becomes oh. empty. And he says, and what actually ends up happening is you create another sense of loss. <laughs> you create a different sense of loss. And what happens then is that particular expression that you're wanting to assess becomes part of the order, but that sense of loss creates another tactical response that creates a different space of meaning. Yes. Right. And every time you chase it to bring it into the order, it runs away in a sense and creates another space. And so it's more just a recognition that there are, in mm. some sense, um, from a, an outcomes perspective, it's more a recognition that there are outcomes that can't be measured and that we shouldn't try and chase them all. Good, thank you. Uh, and sure. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you very much. Um, it was very good to hear you <laughs> tell the story of the OEIC um, and the founding vision because I worked with the OEIC for 30 years and I helped to I worked with Nick Dubalbali on the concept of the founding vision. And I mean, I think I think your application of this uh, too in that context is really interesting. And uh, there's a lot more I could say, actually, um, than we have time for. And if you could send me a copy of your paper, I'd be happy to respond to it uh, in more detail. But one, I just wanted to give an example of one of the things you said was um, espace is slippery. You try to you try to make contact with it. You try to bring it into the center so that the rest of us can benefit from it. But in so doing, you damage that espace. And you yourself, if you're in the center, don't fully grasp the vitality was, that, was, that was there in the, the espace until you started interfering with it. I think that's that's somewhat of an extreme way of putting it, actually. But I want to give an example because um, since 2016, I've been working with one of the AICs in Western Kenya to, in an attempt to write their theology. Okay. Now the writing of the the church didn't ask for the writing of the theology. What they wanted was a handbook that they could give their pastors. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that what they wanted was um, an explanation of what to do when you have to conduct a funeral, when you have to conduct a baptism, what text to, uh, could you read? Um, in other words, something practical that would allow them to, to do their business um, uh, more easily. The people who wanted the written theology, that is the codification, I think, of, of an AIC theology, in a sense, were those uh, members of the AIC who had gone to a Western theological college. So they wanted their espace, where the, their own vitality came from in the AIC, somehow to be the, the, the source of their vitality, to be recognized at a respectable level. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Well, we've we, we've already had three three workshops in an attempt to do this, and most of the workshops have just been listening to the elders. So we now had about nine days uh, over a number of years of, of listening to the elders' stories, uh, their testimonies, uh, discussing and with them certain issues and things like that. So it, it's it, it, um, and creating a handbook from that. And the, the, the handbook of practices is fairly easy. It's not, it's not difficult to do. But we also wanted, for the sake of the AIC students who are in Bible college and learning a Western evangelical theology, which does which pays the AICs no respect at all. 
that they wanted some kind of statement of faith that they could say to their, their evangelical colleagues, look, this is what we think, this is where we are, these are the texts we use, okay? It's been very difficult. It's been very difficult because of COVID, it's been very difficult with, because of church politics in the particular church. Um, but we're, we're back to it, on it again, and in fact, I've been in conversation over the last week about how to proceed. And I suggested that my two Kenyan colleagues, both of whom who are members of these churches, one of them is an archbishop in the church, the other one is, um, they, they both had uh, significant theological training, Western theological And I suggested, but can you just write me five or six key paragraphs on the relationship, say, between the spirit and, and Christ, or relationship between the spirit and the Bible, okay? Just uh, three or four sentences, that's all, nothing heavier than that. I thought they could do it. They probably can do it, but their reaction, and I'm sure they're right, was to say, look, we need another meeting of the elders, of the women's leaders, of some key people in the church. So every time you we, we attempt as a, as a group of elite intellectuals to codify the situation, they say, no, we need to go back to, oh. in your terms, where the vitality is. Into the encounter, where the place where the encounter is taking place. That is where we will get the answers. So who knows whether the next the next meeting will come up with those answers? I think it has to, or at least some of the answers. But I would suggest also that that it, the attempt to, to 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 learn from the AICs and to bring some of their practices into the wider Christian sphere is not a totally uh, self defeating thing. And although it may create a sense of loss in the AIC, but at the same time, it is in that sense of loss that a, that a changed founding vision, driven by the spirit who operates on the edges and in the margins, a, a, a new and, a, 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 as it were, a new expression of that founding vision will emerge. Now, I think this is a continuous, a continual process. So I think that process is worth doing, but it's messy, and I just think we need to, to be aware of the messiness <laughs> as part of the vitality. Mm -hmm. So it's been very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just quickly comment on that? Um, so thank, yeah. thank you, John. I, John, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I knew... Um, I, I knew stepping into this that using the AICs as kind of the background was was going to open me up to all sorts of questions because I, I guess as I mentioned, not an expert, not overly familiar, but I very much have enjoyed the reading that I've done on it so far. So yeah, I will absolutely send you the, the draft of the paper, and then I would love to have any comments. Um, I would I would completely agree with you that I think there is a a, a real benefit of that sort of um, from the ground effort to to create a text as some sort of guiding document, some sort of guiding thought that can then be um, applicable within, within the particular local area, right? And, and I really appreciate that you use the word messy at the end and recognizing that the vitality of it is, is recognizing, yes, as you create this document, as there's some sense of order applied to this, there the process will generate some sense of loss to use the term which then opens up a space for the spirit's vitality to be at work again creating a sense of meaning within that and i think that really helpfully articulates um in a very practical way this tension between the, the ordering in the encounter and how how there is some some sort of dynamic that goes on the question that i would raise that comes out of Serto and it's it's I did my dissertation on him, so so, and and it's trying to come put the whole of the thought of the theorization into in into this article I struggled with, um, or into this this paper is that the framework of time is very significant in his thinking of it, and so what I would probably 
if I were to guess as how it would res how he might respond or or how his you could see within his writing and his examples would say that as you're in the midst right now with the AICs, they're in the midst of this process. And so you see the particular need for the ordering, you see the particular need for the text, and the benefits of it are very immediate and very um, pronounced because it's this particular context. What, what, and the example that Surtout gives is the codification of the French language to say that at, when, when the French language and they came with kind of um, authoritative French in France, the, the process in the immediate had that sense of benefit that as we go to the various regions and as we, as we determine the particular terms that are somewhat universal for the country and we create this and articulate this, this authorita authoritative French language that could be utilized across the nation to provide benefit for trade and analysis and education and various things, um, that, 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 that very immediate benefit was very pronounced, but it's over the extension of time is where you start to see the significance of the challenge. And so while in the moment, and this is just hypothesizing, the AICs are experiencing this, this very pronounced need and this grass work effort is being done to write a text, the question that would I would I would I would ponder to that is um, what's that going to look like in a century? You know, after a couple of generations of use, is is the textualization of the founding vision and the textualization of the immediate need going to replace the encounter going forward? As the initial authors for whom that tension and that messiness is real and pronounced, and they struggle to maintain it. In the succeeding generation, will they carry that same sense of tension between the between the ordering and the encounter, or will they default to the order, in which case the encounter is lost? Very difficult to say that. Uh, I, thought, yes. I, I thought um the this particular church I I worked with had um uh, used to, used to would uh, or goes to Munton um, on the night of New Year's Eve so that they can pray in the new year mm. and receive prophecies about what's going to happen in the new year and also to cleanse them to to to, 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 to repent and and enter the new year as clean <laughs> forgiven people okay uh, and that's still a powerful event but about Ten years ago, the prophecies in that particular event no longer were no longer taking place. So I thought this is this the routinization of charisma, which I think is part of the uh, the process of the, the, you know the codification. But actually, no. Apparently, another another five years, seven years along the line, they started recurring again. So. It would suggest the vitality hasn't been lost; that it's 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 emerged not from the center again, because prophecy rarely emerges from the center. It emerges from people on the margins who just need to be given the space. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a space or not. To be given the space in 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 which to to speak into the community of the faith. I, I've said enough. I better stop. No, so, I think I. Th I think that just helpfully articulates the dynamic that I'm saying. The routinization created a center, but then you've just articulated that the 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 charisma is emerging from the margins again. Yes. And, yes. and then as you were to draw that into the center, a new margin is going to come, which is the new espace. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Paul? Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I just want to say that we never started an impact study because I'm not a metrics guy, and I actually kind of side with your side of things. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is, is I think that's where um, Leo, it gets dangerous in the sense that you try to repeat something in a kind of form rather than allowing the symbiotic relationship to be occurring between those creative elements and the structure that we're in. And so it's interesting because, you know, when I think about a place like OCMS, it really is the students and where students are going with it and 
what they're going to be is kind of a wild radical that I kind of like. I get nervous when we start to constrain that by certain agreed upon goals and outcomes that would then steer people into ways that they're not necessarily going into. All right. So, yeah, I, I, I look at someone like Terry, who's doing mining God's way. If we had if, if we had seen that whole project as something that should be within the silos of mining, or it would never have happened. But it's because OCMS has always been that creative framework. What I would say, though, is at least, you know, this is the second time I've heard it because I was one of your examiners, Jeffrey, when you went through it. So I'm trying to get my head around this or so. It seems to me that the binary of good and bad doesn't work. All right. It's really a dynamic relationship between the two. That's always what makes things work. Take language, for example. We can try to have these boards who set up dictionaries and try to keep it all. And language just runs and M run around it. And people are all of a sudden coming up with words you never and, and then it's in the dictionary because life is just so dynamic that it's always changing. It was when I was when I was teaching English as a second language in China, but I was at this uh, foreign languages uh, university in, in China. And the saddest people of the faculty and the students were those who were in the Esperanto department. <laughs> because it was a dead language. It wasn't alive. The vocabulary was all set, but there wasn't a living body of people who were trying to figure out, well, what word do we use for that? And how does that figure in light of what we're doing? And, you know, so-and-so so uses this, right? you know? And so, but I really, I, I, think you, I think you're onto something here in terms of how do you maintain that kind of living dynamic energy with any framework? But I wouldn't say necessarily myself, that the Leo is the bad guy necessarily. It's part of the process that's always forming, but is always then being challenged and reshaped. But you don't want to kill the living, which is what is changing everything all the time. Yeah, I mean, if I if I if I lent too strongly on the idea of you being the bad guy, that's not not really my intention hmm. um uh, i think i think it's, it's to articulate it um the like the liu and its process at ordering has a potential to be the bad guy right like if it if it if it doesn't give way to the space of encounter and the space of that living messiness and that living meaning and recognize its limitations like liu is good within its particular field. Um, and and it's when it extends beyond that, um, that that it can create the sense of loss and it can create challenges and there can be there can be difficulty. Similarly, um, if if there were no Liu, and this is within a Christian mission context, if there were no ordering about, say, what is the content of the gospel, and we were to allow the content of the gospel to be freely interpreted and understood in every context, then, then you run the risk of, of the, the content of the gospel becoming meaningless because meaningless. It, becomes, right. it becomes it becomes yeah. whatever people want it to be. And so, I mean, there is definitely this, this imperative, I think, to maintain the word of truth, which requires some sense of order. But then, but then the idea of the word becoming flesh is, is that space of encounter. And so there is this tension that I think is even present within scripture and our idea of the incarnation, you know. And so I think it's, it's how do we translate within that to our, our research organizations, our educational organizations, our churches, our mission practice to have that. We maintain a sense of order where order is due and then we allow the living vitality of the tradition and the charisma to take place yeah. and and there is that mutual dynamic and it's it's something i know i need to flesh out better that there is the potential for a mutual benefit to take place 
Whereas at the same time, there is the potential for mutual destruction. It's a completely different note, but this is why, why John Polkinghorne argues that you must embrace Darwin's theory of evolution to be Christian. Because he argues that, that Darwin understood the need for continual change and development for life to be. And 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 it's it's a brilliant thesis, but it's on a different model. But he was saying, if you if you dump Darwin, you dump Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a pretty bold claim that I'm not sure would fly very well where I'm at right now. <laughs> so, uh, can I see any hands raised now here? Maybe. Okay, okay. Just, just a, a, a question. Thank you. This is uh, really, uh, I'm seeing how this dynamic on so many levels, even in my, in my, in my context. Um, but maybe just a question. Uh, these uh, Liu and Escape um, different portals, uh, how much would you say they are personality or person driven? Uh, like, for example, um, there is the, the New York illustration that you gave the mayor, and then there's the gang leader who is in charge of the street, and, you know, how, how much the life of the individual leader in that space controls his domain and, and yeah. vice versa. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, if I, if it, yeah, to, to respond to that, what I would say is very much so, like depending on the on the scale, like especially in the context of the gang leader and the gang, um, like that's that's a very, very practical, like evident and even even just a, a very charismatic leader within any organization like a church, how, how the church um, or the organization takes on in some sense very much the personality of the leader. But and and that's very connected to the idea of Serto that that the order is determined by a will and a power. So so the will behind it it will be shaped by whoever it is has the will and the power. Um, from a, a larger scale, I think it's I think it's evident on a national on a national scale, international scale. You can look at the way the governments shape um, government policy and practice, and and the per, almost the personality of a nation can be shaped by um by the people in power um i think it's some of the some of the genius of having regular elections is that um then the the strong personality of an individual leader um has has less capacity for shaping the whole of the order um if if they can't be in for too long um right and so i think you can see it within within nations with whom in where leaders have been present for decades and decades that the order is very much becomes almost an extension of them as a person. Um, but I think it would be also key to, to distinguish the fact that um, as, as, as Sertot would articulate it, that that driving will and power doesn't have to be a person. It can be a document. It can be oh. a text. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so for instance, if you were to take, I mean, just within my particular context of, of working in local church, um, if you were to take a particular, a particular literal translation of the scripture as the will behind the organization of the church, and then that becomes the authoritative power to construct the church in a certain way. And and it and it's it's then the people within the church who are trained to interpret scripture in that same way. Then in that sense, the text holds that ordering potential and power. I I mean I was going to give it in reference to um, to my my mention to John about the idea that it's hard to know that as he said the routinization of charisma what the long term effects will, of that will be. Um, but I think if you were to take a bit of a historical example where. Um, the textualization or the routinization of a set of ideas was established within a text that has in some sense become um, become not a living document as it was intended, but in some sense is a dead document that still has that will to power, um, uh, that will and power. You could look at the American Constitution and certain amendments within the within the American Constitution. When it was originally set out by the founding fathers, it was designed to be a living document. 
that was the original intention. He had established the nation at a particular place and time, the Declaration of Independence, the establishment of the nation with the view that, which is why it's built into the constitution that the amendments can be changed, with the view that changes can take place over time. But over the however many centuries, 400 years of the nation or 300 years of the American nation, I can't remember, 280 years, whatever it is, the American nation, I think there's been two constitutional amendments um like within within the american constitution and you can see the fight over here over the second amendment and the right to bear arms and how um the right to own a gun is taken as by some because of the way that the text has been codified and has in some sense ceased to be a living document this mm -hmm. right to bear arms is not just an allowance for a place and time to defend themselves against imposing dominant social orders it's become a justification for me to be fully armed and mm -hmm. and so it's created conflict within the country because that text that routinization has become static it is no longer dynamic and the space for interpretation has been removed and which is why you have such conflict over something like that in a country like the united states Thank you, Jeffrey, for your excellent presentation and uh, interaction with us. Um, we have got a lot of things to take away today, mm -hmm. but one particular thing for me is living vitality in messiness. <laughs> Thank you again, and we hope to see you again soon here in Oxford. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful.